of that, didn't I? Did I say that right? Yes. What's up? Well, that's how we say it. All right. Hey, um, one other difference between Kevin and me, you will notice it if you watch me dance. That there's a little difference. I'm a much better dancer than Kevin. I can't admit it right now. Come on. So we've had Kevin come up to our church, and we've been friends now for years. And uh, he came. <laughs> he came in February, which is the middle of our winter. And winter in Michigan is not like winter here. So there was tons of snow, and he actually was there on the coldest day of the year. So being the fearless influencer that he is, he said, I'm going outside to take a picture. So we put so many coats on him, he walked outside like this. And uh, we got the picture forever. We we're impressed forever. So, hey, uh, I am so honored to be asked be, be asked to speak to you. And I visited your church several times, and uh, I've, I've spoken at Hill City a few times, and I've always secretly wanted to speak here, so when Kevin invited me, uh, I was thrilled. And I love the ministry you're doing here, I love what you're doing in the downtown area, and uh, very similar to what we're trying to do in our church in Michigan, and so it is an honor for me to be here. And uh, I also want to introduce a friend of mine that's here, Joel, has traveled with me, and I'd have him stand so that you'd know who he is, but I bet you can tell who he is. <laughs> and so uh, we are we're really glad to be here. So I want to talk to you about uh, one of the things that Jesus uh, told us all to do. In fact, I'd say it was number one on his to-do list for us. It was the number one thing he said. And uh, if you've read the Bible and, and you're familiar with Jesus, you'll know this. He said, I want you to make disciples. That's what I want you to do. Number one thing, you go make disciples. So that's what I want to talk to you about today. Pretty basic, maybe. Uh, if you are not a normal churchgoer, if you're not right now a follower of Jesus and you're wondering, oh, is this going to be relevant? Uh, my thought is, uh, as you're figuring out if you're going to come to Jesus, maybe a great question to answer is, so if I did, how would I grow? How would I move into the kind of person Jesus wants me to be? And that's, when we talk about making disciples, that's the question that we're answering. So uh, let me answer three questions about why I think you need to make disciples. And the first question will just be answering the question, why? Why would you even do it? The second would be, when? When do you start doing it? When are you qualified to start making disciples? And then the third is, how do you do it? All right? I'll make a disciple. What do I do? So those are the three things we're going to try and hit. And uh, if you have Bibles and you like to follow in your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Timothy. And if you didn't bring it, we'll bring the verses up on the screen as well. So let me start off with this. Uh, one of the followers of Jesus was a man named Peter. And Peter wrote a book called 1 Peter. And in the second chapter of 1 Peter, he uh, is talking about you and me. He's talking about followers of Jesus. And he uses a metaphor, a word picture. And he calls us stones. He says, believers... Followers of Jesus are like stones. So just so that we're clear about that, I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, you are a stone. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you're enjoying that a little too much. And so uh, we are stones. And Peter said, you are stones. In fact, he called us living stones. And he said, you together form a spiritual house. And I imagine he's talking about the church, that when we come together, we form the church. And uh, I, around Nairobi, there are some buildings that are made out of stones, and some very nice buildings that are made out of stones. And you look at them, and they're massive, they're, they're majestic, you know, you, you love looking at them. But here's the truth about a building made out of stones. Only as powerful as the stones themselves. If the stones are flawed, if the stones somehow are weak, 
How big the building is makes no difference. How impressive the building makes no difference. It's all up to how strong the stones are. And when we talk about discipleship, we're answering the question, how do you make those stones strong? And the reason I think that Peter emphasizes the importance of the stones is because he had walked with Jesus for three years. And I want you to think about this. So Jesus comes to earth, and Jesus has a three-year ministry. So he only has three years to do everything he has to do. And just think about the things Jesus had to accomplish. So he had to bring a whole new truth to humanity. He had to talk about God in ways that people have not heard. He had to talk about how the relationship works. He had a massive information-giving project of telling people who God is and how to relate to him. Secondly, uh, you may know, he had to die for sins. He had to somehow connect sinful people with a holy God. And so he has this whole atonement part where he has to die for sins. And then thirdly, he had to start the church. There was no church before Jesus. So he's formulating the church, the church that has now become a movement that has gone all around the world. And he had to start that. And when I think of those major things that he had to accomplish, if that had been me, if the Father had given me an assignment and said, these are the things you're going to accomplish, I think this is the way I would have done it. Uh, I would have scheduled a world tour. I would have written a whole bunch of books. Uh, I would have had massive crusades. I would have gone on Oprah. I would have done anything I could to sort of make the biggest splash possible. But do you know how Jesus did it? The primary thing he did over three years is he poured into a few people. He poured into the 12 men that followed him around, his disciples. He poured into a few other men and women. And that was his focus. He said, of everything that I have to do, that's going to be the most important. You know why? Because he said, it's only as strong as a stone. And the way stones are made strong is one person pouring into another person. He modeled it for it, modeled us for that. And in my mind, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. It's what we are called to do. So let me give you a definition of discipleship, just so that you have it in your mind. A discipleship is pouring into someone else to grow as a fearless influence. That's all it is. It's you pouring into someone else so that they grow to be a fearless influence. That's discipleship. And uh, when I became a Christian, so I became a Christian when I was in high school, going into my junior year in high school, obviously only a few years ago. And uh, there was this guy named Gene, and Gene led me to the Lord. But I'm so glad that he led me to the cross, but he didn't leave me at the cross. And Gene started to pour into me. So it was through Gene that I learned who Jesus was. It was through Gene that I learned how to read the Bible. I'd never read it before. I didn't know the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Never read it before. Gene taught me how to read and study the Bible. I was not raised in a Christian home. So it was through Gene that I first saw how a Christian husband relates to his wife, or a Christian father relates to his children. Never seen that before. Gene was the one that got me serving for the first time. He was the one who said, okay, Kevin, you've seen me lead a Bible study. I want you to lead a Bible study. And I was like, what? I can't lead a Bible study. You can lead a Bible study. It was Gene, actually, who was the first one who said to me, Kevin, I think you're being called into ministry, full-time ministry. Kevin, you're, you're going to do that. I am so glad Gene didn't leave me at the cross that when I became a Christian, a follower of Jesus, he saw his work was just starting and he poured in. So whenever you wonder about the question, why is it important? It's important because it's the way Jesus did it. It's important because the church is only as strong as the stones that make it up. And I want to switch gears now and talk to you about 
when it would be right for you to do it. When is it right? When are you prepared? When are you qualified? When does uh, God tap you on the shoulder and say, okay, your turn to start discipling people? And, and the answer might surprise you a little. So uh, I don't want to just talk about Gene and me. Let me talk about two characters from the Bible. You uh, probably know about the Apostle Paul, right? So Paul is this amazing Christian leader. He's going around uh, the world at that time, the Mediterranean world, the Roman world, and he is spreading the gospel. He is planting churches and he's talking to uh, people about Jesus. And on his second trip, on his second missionary trip, uh, he goes through what is now modern day Turkey. And as he goes through there, he passes a city, Lystra, and in that city is a young man about 18 or 19 years old. His name is Timothy. And Timothy is already a Christian, which is interesting because it's before Paul gets to the city. So the gospel is spread even without Paul doing all of it. And he comes into the city and Timothy's there. And Timothy has this amazing reputation of being a very focused influencer of society. He already has an amazing reputation. And do you know who had molded Timothy? It was his mother and his grandmother. We don't even know if his father was a believer. But his mother and his grandmother poured into Timothy. And Paul comes through Lystra, and he spends a little time with Timothy, and then he says to Timothy, Timothy, I want you to come with me. I want you to come on the rest of my trip. And Timothy says yes. And for the next 13 years, Timothy is with Paul. And Paul, of course, has a huge influence on Timothy. And Timothy has a huge influence on Paul. Paul loves Timothy so much that by uh, the end of his ministry life, he just refers to Timothy as my son. You are my son. So let's talk a little bit about when it is that God would say, you are ready. You are ready to disciple someone. Most of us, I think, say, well, I'm no Apostle Paul, so is that what I need to be? Do I need to be like Paul before I can do this? And uh, if you've ever wondered that, and if you've held back, maybe you've been challenged to be a discipler, and you've held back, I will tell you that I can relate to you. So uh, I've been a Christian for a little over 40 years. I've been in full-time ministry almost that whole time. And for years and years and years and years, I said, uh, I, I am not prepared to disciple other people. I don't know enough. I'm not godly enough. I still have areas of my life that are sinful and that I can't seem to figure out. And I kept on saying, when I get all that together, I will start discipling someone else. And so, uh, you know, I continue to get older and older and older. And uh, finally, uh, Jesus spoke to me. Now, he did not speak audibly, but he prompted me. It was very clear this thought came from Jesus' mind. I was thinking about the discipleship thing again, pushing it off one more time, and Jesus said, okay, Kevin, I have one question for you. When do you think you'll be ready? How much longer do you need to walk with me before you're ready to start pouring out? And he followed that question up with another question, which is, and Kevin, since you've been a Christian for like, at this point, 35 years, and you're not quite ready, I'm just wondering, who else in your church do you think might be ready, if you're not? And I realized that as these thoughts crossed my mind, that the excuses I was making that held no water, the idea that you need to know everything, the idea that you need to have your life perfect, don't ever let that stop you because it will stop you forever. You'll never start. And Jesus pressed it a little bit more. He said, you know what? You think that you're just being humble? That you're like, well, I don't have it all together, so I don't know. And Jesus said, it's not humility. You're just being selfish. You just have an attitude that it still needs to all be about you. It's still about you growing and you becoming a better leader, a better teacher. It's about you focusing on you. So it's not a maturity issue. It's just a selfishness issue. And so at that point, I did start reluctantly 
to pour into some other people. And now I can tell you, it is the most fun that I have. I love it more than anything else I do. Of all the things I get to do, to teach or to lead or to speak at a fearless conference, my favorite thing is to spend time with younger leaders and just pour into them. I am so glad that Jesus kind of shook me out. So let me ask you, do you think that you're ready? Do you think you're ready? And there will always be excuses. I was talking with Kevin about this, and Kevin said that uh, right now you guys have had a little downturn in your economy, and uh, most of you are younger than me, and I know that that probably impacts you. you maybe you are concerned about your jobs or how much income you're bringing in. I get it. I know you have elections coming up, and elections sometimes in Kenya don't go so smoothly. And I was talking with Kevin, and he said, you know, the candidates maybe aren't the greatest candidates, and you're sort of... There's some angst about that. And let me just say this. I know something about that. <laughs> Donald Trump is our president. Okay, so I get it. I get it. Yeah. But I just want to say, there will always be things. There will always be things that you're still working on trying to figure out. But you know, Timothy uh, was a young guy. By the time that Paul wrote the, the letter of 1 Timothy to Timothy, he was the pastor at a church called Ephesus. And so he wrote a letter to him. He's about 30 years old now. And people are coming to Timothy and they're saying, you're too young to lead. You're too young to disciple other people. And Paul would have none of it. And so when that happened, Paul wrote these words to Timothy in a letter to Timothy. He said this, uh, 1 Timothy 4.2, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. They will. They'll box you in. They'll say, you're not qualified yet. Don't even try it. Wait until you're like as old as Kevin. Wait until, you know, your beard is white. Then maybe. And Paul says, no, no. Don't let anyone look down. Don't let anyone box you in. And then he says, he says, but set an example for believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and in purity. Set an example. Bring people in, pour into them, pour these things into them. You won't do it perfectly, Timothy. I know that. Not asking for that. But what you've got, you need to pour out. The position that God has given you, the friendships he's given you, the relationship with someone that you might be a little bit further along then, God gave you that. And he said, I need you to pour out. One of the great lines by a pastor named Andy Stanley, I love this line. He says, uh, it is not your responsibility to fill another person up. But it is your responsibility to pour yourself out. And that has been so freeing to me. When I think, listen, it's not my job to make this person into Jesus. I mean, I'm not like Jesus as much as I want to be. That's not my job. My job is not to fill you up. But my job is to pour out. The Holy Spirit will make up the difference. Other believers will come up and make up the difference. I'm not here to fill you up all the way. But I am here to pour out. And I just want to encourage you. Think that way. Think that way. If you think you're trying to fill someone up, you'll never do it because you'll say, I can't do that. But God never called you to do that. He just says, pour out. You pour out. Uh, we do uh, Mazizi in our church. We call it Rooted, but it's the same, it was virtually the same. Ten week deal. And so whenever we get to, done with a Rooted course, uh, we will invite people who have just gone through Rooted to step up and maybe lead a group. We need you to lead groups, and that's how we get our leaders. And so we had done that. We had gone through, and we had... I don't know, two or three hundred people go through, and so we sort of threw out this challenge. Hey, if you've gone through, root it. We'd love to have you leave. And uh, after, after I'd said that, we closed in prayer, only one person came up to me. And it was a young woman uh, named Christine. And if I had picked one person out of that whole group, the two or three hundred people that were there, if I picked one person, and I would have said, least likely to lead a rooted group, it would have been Christine. 
And uh, Christine was sweet as could be. And she did love Jesus. But she had some physical problems. Uh, she was as shy as could be. I mean, when she talked to me, she looked down. And she was socially super awkward. She did not have a lot of friends. And she came up, sort of looking down. She goes, Pastor Kevin, I think, um, I think maybe, I'm just wondering if, if, if maybe I should lead her than like, like a Rudy. <laughs> and I was like, all right, Christine. This is one of those times I think maybe you should go home and pray about it. <laughs> and she said, um, Pastor Kevin, um, I, I actually, I've been praying about it like for a long time. And, and I think Jesus might have said that I should lead a rooting. And so I said, okay, okay. And I uh, handed her off to the guy that leads Rooted, and I said, Christine wants to lead a group. So anyway, you know, we, we sort of trained her up, and the next session came on, and she was going to lead a women's group. And uh, as she, her women were assembled, all of her women were older than her. She, she was about 30 years old. All the women were older than her. And I was so concerned. I was so concerned. Ugh. Feel bad for Christine. I think we're putting her in a place that she can't win. Feel bad for these ladies. They signed up for Rooted. It's probably not going to be a great experience for them. And uh, as the Rooted started to go on, uh, these women would come up to me unsolicited. I wouldn't talk to them. They'd come up to me and they would say, We love Rooted. And thank you for giving us Christine. She's an amazing Rooted. And I'd say, really, what, what makes her so great? What, what makes her so great? And they said, because she's so imperfect. Because she needs our help. Because when we talk about things, she's never talking down to us. And we become a sisterhood. I mean, we kill for each other. Thank you for having the wisdom of putting Christine in that position. <laughs> so great. They don't know. <laughs> Listen, if you know Jesus and you're growing in Jesus in any way, you're ready. You're ready. The when is now. Anything else is an excuse. Anything else is an excuse. Maybe an excuse somebody else makes for you, you make for yourself. I'm saying you're ready. So let me do with the remaining time that I have, let me give you uh, three things to think about if you're going to do this. So you, Let's say that I've convinced you all, and you're like, okay, I'm ready to disciple someone. How do I do that? How do I actually do it? And I think there's just three things to think about when you're doing it. Uh, the first, and we learned this actually from what Paul does with Timothy, the first is you need to create, as a disciple or as somebody that's going to mentor or disciple someone else, you need to create a learning environment. You need to create a learning environment. An environment where there is teaching and there is discussion. Okay, so now here's why this is important. People don't know the Bible. I don't know how you feel about it. I don't know if you feel super confident. Yes, I know the Bible pretty well. But I will tell you, and this is not just in Kenya, this is in the United States, it is around the world. People don't read as much, and it means they don't read the Bible as much. They don't know the Bible. And so learning must occur. To just assume that people know already what the Bible says about something, what the Bible says about sex. If your assumption is, well, kind of everyone knows what the Bible says about sex, I would say, you are wrong. If you think, you know, about how you work or about how you speak, and you think, well, everyone knows that. I'm telling you, not everyone knows that. People do not know that. They do not have a Christian worldview. Wherever they've come out of, their worldview is probably much more secular than you think. It means there needs to be a learning environment. You need to be intentional. And as I say that, I think some of you are saying, so that cancels me out right here because I am no Bible scholar. If you're looking for me to sit them down and to walk them through books of the Bible and teach them what it says, I cannot do that. Fair enough. 
You don't need to do that. You need to create an environment where learning happens. You need to initiate that environment. And so I will give you great news. There's all kinds of teaching out there. You can come here every week and hear somebody teach you. You can go online. There are more sermons than you could listen to in a thousand lifetimes every week. There are books to read. There are blogs to read. It is not an issue of getting into an environment where you can learn something together. You may not be the primary teacher, but you must be the initiator. You don't need to be an expert. You just need to initiate it. And here's the thing that you can do that I can't do right now. You've probably noticed this. I'm doing all the talking. Have you noticed that? I know you probably want to talk, but I get to. Do you know how you learn the best? Is when you talk. And you can do that. You can create an environment where you say something, or you read something together, or you wrestle with something, maybe in the Bible, and you have a discussion. And that's where people grow the most. And you get to do that when you disciple, when you're in one-on-one -on -one setting, where there's just a couple or three of you in a group. So you can do this. You can create the learning environment. When Paul was talking to Timothy, in 1 Timothy 13 and 14, he says these words. Uh, why don't we read this together? We'll all read this up on the screen. So together, let's say, what you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Is there any more? Is that it? That's good enough. I like that verse. Okay, so, what? listen, what he's saying is, you've already heard it. You've heard teaching. You've heard things that are out there. Keep the pattern. And if we were to read the next verse, it would say, this has been deposited into you, Timothy. You have this as deposit. This teaching has been deposited into you. Guard it and deposit it into someone else. So Kevin and I were talking about this coming. You don't need to know everything. If you're one step ahead of somebody else, just give them what you already got. Hey, I was at church today. There was this white bald guy that was speaking to us. Has an amazing beard, but that's like it. <laughs> and uh, and he said, he said, listen, you can decide. Or he said, hey, listen, not everybody knows the Bible real well. We can help people get to know it. If you're one step ahead, you got something to say. You got something to teach. Use it. Don't just let it deposit into you. You're to deposit it into others. First thing, learning, teach and discuss. Second thing, teach and discuss, important, not enough. There has to be a doing environment. A doing environment. Doing. You've all heard the axiom, more is caught than taught. More is caught than taught. You know that it's true. Hanging out with someone has much more of an influence than listening to somebody speak. Doing. You need to open your life up so that somebody else can join you. And uh, I don't know how filled your lives are. You may say, I have maxed out my amount of relationships. But I'm telling you this, you cannot disciple someone else unless you open your life to them. They have to be with you as you, in a very practical way, in a very imperfect way, Try to walk with Jesus. They learn from the things you do well, and they learn from the things you mess up. More is caught than taught. You must open up your life. You're really interested in having an impact. Again, uh, Timothy uh, enjoyed this with Paul. Remember, they were together for 13 years. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy when he's talking about this doing part. 2 Timothy uh, 3, 10, and 11 says this. Uh, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings. That's great. You know all about that because you were with me. 13 years. We'd go into a city. You would watch me try to meet people. 
You'd watch me maybe go to the synagogue and talk to the Jews in the synagogue about Jesus. You'd watch me try to build leaders. You'd watch me share the gospel with people. You know, all these spiritual things. But you know what else you watch? You watch what happened when, like, I had an upset stomach and I was up all night needing to go to the bathroom. You watched me do that, too. You watched when I stubbed my toe and what I said when I stubbed my toe. <laughs> you know what? You watched me just be so discouraged with, with someone that I poured my life into, and then they turned on me. You watched that happen. And then you watched my joy when someone said yes to Jesus for the first time. You got to pee there. Timothy, you've seen it. I opened my life to you. You know, Gene, this guy that had such an impact on me, uh, he did teach me. There's no question. He taught me. But by far, his biggest influence is he invited me into his life. I was at his house so much my last two years of high school, he should have charged me rent. I mean, his wife was, I'm sure, sick of me. And Gene would just, whatever he was doing, he'd just include me. Hey, Kevin, I've got to drive over to the store. Come on with me. Okay. Kevin, you know, we're going to put together this swing set for the kids. Help me do it. Okay. You know, whatever it was, we're going to watch James Bond. Okay. Okay, we're going to church together. Great. I just hung out, just watched. It had a huge, huge impact on me. And I'm challenging you, if you think you can disciple somebody by just meeting with them once a week for a Bible study, it is not enough. All it will do is fill the head a little. And that's good. But there's so much more to walking with Jesus, right? It's not just knowing a scripture. It's like, how does that actually work into life? And you know what? Um, if you're uncomfortable with the learning, the doing should make you feel more comfortable. Because it's not like doing special things. It's just doing what you do. And if your thought along those lines is, I don't have time, uh, let me say two things about that. One is, uh, take this the right way for me. Make the time. Make the time. It's worth it. So I agree. You may have to cut some things out of your schedule if you're going to invite somebody into your life. But I'd say do it. Do it. But here's the second thing. It doesn't take that much time to invite somebody to do what you're already doing, does it? I mean, if you're already going to cook dinner tonight, how much harder is it to invite this person over to cook dinner with you? If you're already going to church, how hard is it to say, meet me at church, or I'll pick you up? How hard is it to just invite somebody into what you're already doing? So uh, for this trip, uh, I made a decision to come really late, and it was just about two weeks ago, a little over two weeks ago, that I finally decided I was coming out. I had some things that were happening, so I made the decision to come. And when I made the decision to come, just as I was making that decision, I happened to be uh, having a discussion with uh, Joel. Joel and I were just hanging out and talking. And a thought occurred to me. I said, Joel, how would you like to go to Africa? And he's like, what? He goes, yeah. Like, when? Like, in 10 days. And I said, if you can come up with the money for the ticket, you can come. And Joel's like, I'm in. I'm in. And so here, we, one of the best parts of my trip, of course, besides talking to all of you, has been hanging out with Joel. We just hung out together. We've gotten to know each other so much better on this trip. And you know what? It's not added one thing to my schedule. Because I was coming anyway. You can do this. Listen, you can do this. You can create a learning environment and a doing environment. And then third, let me just wrap up with this. The third step is a coaching environment. The third step is a coaching environment. Okay, so coaching is where you encourage people and you equip them. So here's why this is so important. Here's why this is so important. Uh, you do need to pour into someone, but your job's not done until they start to pour into someone else. And this is a big problem with our discipleship. We see that our whole role is just to pour into someone. And we get a bunch of people that have been poured into, but they don't know how to pour out. If you're going to disciple someone, you have to coach them. There comes the time where you have to let them do something. You have to maybe push them into doing something. 
How many of you, at some point in your life here, have gotten your driver's license? Okay, so you know how to drive. Okay, so a lot of you. So maybe it went something like this. Whoever was going to teach you how to drive uh, sat you in the car and just started to talk to you about, here's what you need to know when you drive. Here's where the gas pedal is. Here's the brake. Don't confuse the two. You know, here's how you check your mirrors. And do, okay, so they talked to you. Learning environment. Then they actually turned on the car and they started driving. And you started watching them drive and they're driving around and you're, you know, you're sort of paying attention. But you know, the point comes if you're going to actually drive where you have to get the keys and you sit behind the steering wheel and you're the one that turns on the key. And the person that's been teaching you now sits in the passenger seat. And their role now is to coach you. Their role now is to say, I've done everything I can to prepare you, but you will learn no more without you doing. That's coaching. It's essential. It makes you nervous when they throw you the keys. And I've taught four of my children how to drive. It made me really nervous that they were going to drive for the first time. But it's the only way. So I told you, you know, um, I've been a, a Christian for about a year, and I've sat in a few Bible studies that Gene had taught, and we went on this retreat, and he said, um, you're going to lead a small group discussion. And I said, I can't do that. And he said, I know. I'm like, you know? He goes, yeah, I know you'll be terrible. But how are you going to learn how to do it if you don't just start doing it? You need to do it. And I was terrible. I taught heresy the whole time, I'm sure. <laughs> but you know, you got to take that first step. You know, the first time you lead something, you're not going to be any good at it. It doesn't mean you don't have a gift of leadership. It's just like first step is always pretty pathetic. But then you have a second step and a third step, and a coach is pushing you along the way. There's all kinds of equipping that needs to happen just as you show them how to do it and you watch them and they kind of mess it up and you say, maybe you try it this way next time. And they do this and you're like, oh, that was great. Don't do that again. Do that. That's great. It's coaching. The most important thing you will say when you coach someone else are these words. You can do it. You can do it. Do you know that as someone who disciples another person, you will believe in that person before they believe in themselves? And when you say, when you say, you can do it, they'll believe you. They'll believe you. Just that you said it. That is what a coach says. You can do it. You can fix this thing up. You can build this thing. You can lead this thing. You can teach this thing. You can do it. The church came to me. I was 19 years old. I became a Christian when I was 16. When I was 19, the church came to me and said, we want you to be our youth pastor. And I dreamed of being a youth pastor because Gene was a youth pastor. But I was so nervous, and I just knew I was too young. And so I went to Gene, and I said, Gene, this church has asked me to be their youth pastor. And I was sure he was going to say, you're not ready for that. I knew I wasn't ready for it. And you know what Gene said? You know what he said. You can do it. You can do it. Kevin, you need to do that. You can do it. Fast forward. I'm 37 years old. I've been a pastor and a leader in a church now for a long time. I've always been the associate pastor. And a church comes to me and says, we want you to be our senior pastor. And I was like, there, there's no way. There's no way. And so I called up Gene, and I said, Gene, craziest thing has happened. This church has asked me to be a senior pastor. And I was sure he was going to say, yeah, you know what? You're great as an associate pastor. <laughs> and that's not what Gene said. He said, Kevin, you can do that. You can do it. And I remember he said this. He said, Kevin, if you were the senior pastor of a church, I would go to that church. And so, yeah, with fear and trepidation, I moved into being a senior pastor. When you coach, the words you can do it are so important. 
And here's what I want to tell you about disciple. You can do it. You can do it. I'm telling you, you can do it. I know my own road, and I didn't think I could, and I got into it, and I wasn't so good. But you keep going, and you can do it. You can do it. You can create learning environments for people. You'll mess it up. That's okay. Just keep at it. You'll invite them into your life, and they'll see you do some things that are good and maybe a whole bunch of things that aren't so good, and that's okay because nobody asks you to be perfect, even the person you're discipling. And you can create a coaching environment where you help them to start doing things. You give them a chance, and you keep saying, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And I want to tell you, you can do it. Will you do it? Will you do it? I've been uh, thinking about Jean a lot lately. Because about three weeks ago, I heard that Jean was sick. And he's still a pretty young guy. And four days later, he died. And it was shocking. Nobody saw that coming. So I went to his memorial service in California, so I had to fly out for that. And uh, there was 1,500 people at his memorial service. And you know, most of those were people that Gene had said, you can do it. And when I think about legacy, and I imagine even now you're thinking about legacy, what difference am I gonna make that I'm here? What will be my legacy? I wanna tell you what your legacy is. Your legacy are the people you disciple. Those are the people that keep going on. The fact that I'm standing on the stage in Nairobi three weeks after Gene has died is a legacy to Gene. Because if he would not poured into me, I would not be standing on this stage. And that's your legacy. And you can do it. You can do it. Will you do it? Would you stand? I want to pray over you. And I want to commission you as a disciple. So uh, in our church, uh, when we do something like this, we just ask if you hold out your hands like that. So if you'd hold out your hands, I'd like to commission you as a disciple. So Lord, thank you for this time that we've had. And thank you for this group of people. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you for the work you're doing in this church and the work you're doing in each person here, how you're building your stones. And now, Lord, before you, I commission these people that have their hands held out, I commission them as those who will disciple, those who will pour into others so that they can grow as fearless influencers of society. I pray, Lord, that as they get discouraged or confused, that they will push on. I pray, Lord, that somehow supernaturally through their influence, the people they're pouring into will become more like you. And we know it's not because we're great. It's because you're great and your spirit lives in us and your spirit is great. And so now, Lord, I pray that you give conviction to every person here, a calling to every person here. You can disciple. I will disciple. I am going to pour into somebody's life. And Lord, we'll give you all the glory and honor as we do it. And it's in Jesus' name and God's people agreed and said, Amen. Amen.